Who's got prayerlings? Welcome to third week of Easter Mountains. <clears throat> it's Tuesday today. I just knocked Jesus over. Yes, I did. Sorry, Jesus. Hope he's not mad. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday, May the 3rd, and it's still 2022. And... I don't know what the weather's doing today. Yesterday it was weird till about three or so when the sun came out and then it acted like spring. Now today it's back acting like, I don't know. I don't know, I didn't see the weather today either. So I can't help you there. Sorry. Uh, I do know it's Tuesday though. Here's what we're doing today, if you're interested. We are praying Psalm 75. We're going to hear from Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, which, and I'll warn you in advance, it's the genealogy of Jesus. And hearing me read it may be boring, although I'll try not to let it be boring. But I chose that lesson out of the four lessons that we have for today because I want to tell you something really interesting about the genealogy of Jesus that impacts our lives even to this very day. Our hymn today is O Sons and Daughters of the King, which 
is 139, I think, in this hymnal. Oh, I'm wrong. Hang on. Wait, maybe I'm not wrong. <gasps> I'm not wrong! When did that ever happen? 139 in our hymnal. Yes, it has nine verses, but they're short. So this isn't a hymn that goes on for 12 minutes. Also, in our hymnal, it starts with and ends with Alleluia's. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. It's not on this recording. You hear it on the organ, but the people don't sing it. I just sang it for you, so you know. Why would you want to hear others? <laughs> the people singing today are the Redeemer Choir from Austin, Texas, and that's all I know about them. That's their name, the Redeemer Choir, and they're from Austin, Texas, and they are very good. So that's what we're doing today. I'll try not to cough all over you today. I make no promises. But today I'm more worried about sneezing all over you. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. All right. Do I need to tell you anything else? Here's today's mug. Just because that's the shape I wanted today. Sometimes I pick mugs by shape. And for some reason, I like these little short, wide ones. I don't know. They're cute. That's why. All right. Matins. Page 131, if you have the green hymnal. If you don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to find my brain. I'll be right back. We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia, Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, the heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O oh, come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Psalm 75. 
We give you thanks, O God. We give you thanks, calling upon your name and declaring all your wonderful deeds. I will appoint a time, says God. I will judge with equity. Though the earth and all its inhabitants are quaking, I will make its pillars fast. I will say to the boasters, boast no more. To the wicked, do not toss your horns. Do not toss your horns so high, or speak with a proud neck. For judgment is neither from the east, nor from the west, nor yet from the wilderness, nor from the mountains. It is God who judges. He puts down one and lifts up another. For in the Lord's hand there is a cup full of spiced and foaming wine, which he pours out. And all the wicked of the earth shall drink and drain the dregs. But I will rejoice forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. He shall break off all the horns of the wicked, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Let us pray. Father, by the passion of your Son, you proclaimed the final judgment of the world. When you raised Christ upon the cross, you deposed the Prince of Darkness. Strike down the pride that rules our hearts and raise us to the glory of the resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, here is our hymn, O Sons and Daughters of the King.
forgot to tell you how they made that little turn of phrase there at the end of each verse. I really like that. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the very first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminabad. Aminab uh, sorry, I read that backwards. Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abiyah, and Abiyah, the father of Asa. And Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. In our book here, the book I use, there's a little um, reflection on Matthew in the King James Version by Thomas Fuller, who lived in the 17th century, who finds this interesting. In the genealogy, he says, speaking to the Lord, he says, Lord, I find the genealogy of my Savior strangely checkered with four remarkable changes in four immediate generations. Reboam begat Abiyah, that is, a bad father begat a bad son. Abiyah begat Asa, that is, a bad father, a good son. Asa begat Jehoshaphat, that is, a good father, a good son. Jehoshaphat begat Joram, that is, a good father, a bad son. I see, Lord, from this that my father's piety cannot be entailed. That is bad news for me. But I see also that actual impiety is not always hereditary, and that is good news for my son. I love that. That's not what I want to talk about, but I did want to share that with you. I just think that's, that's a beautiful insight there. That we can garner things 
from the genealogy of Jesus that most people skip over. We don't read that because it's a genealogy and it's boring. And who wants to read that? Blech. And Thomas Fuller saw from that that his standing in the kingdom has nothing to do with whether or not his father was righteous. And the same for his son standing in the kingdom. But I like how he says that. I see that, Lord, that my my standing in the kingdom has nothing to do with what, with my father's righteousness, which is bad news for me, but it's really good news for my son. <laughs> there's, there's spiritual honesty right there. But I also have four things I'd like to point out from the genealogy of Jesus, and that is there are in this genealogy four women women did you hear me four women and none of them is jewish none of them is jewish that's really important and here's who they are tamar rahab Ruth and Bathsheba and how they got into this genealogy and why Matthew decided to tell us about them it's stellar you might not remember all of their stories Tamar was married to one of Judah's sons, Judah being one of the twelve. There were twelve then. One of the sons of of um oh, my poor brain. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. One of the sons of Jacob. You know, from whom we get the twelve tribes of Israel? Judah. Where we get the name Judah for the big country that you know, Judah. Anyway, um, she was married to one of his sons who died. So because of the way the law is set up, she then married a younger son, the next younger son, who also died. So then she had to marry the third younger son, and he was not of marrying age yet. And she knew the law. The law was, it's written that way, so that the man who died, the her original husband, he died childless. So it's so that his line is perpetuated. So you marry his brother and have children with his brother, and they become the, the children of the man who died. That's how that works. So the third son was not old enough to be married yet. And Judah procrastinated and procrastinated and procrastinated and procrastinated. And I think mostly because he was afraid that this son would marry Tamar and also die. Because there seems to be something weird going on there. But anywho, uh, one day Judah and his servant forget the servant's name. Anyway, they went into the city for the shearing of the sheep. And along the way, he ran into a prostitute. Judah did. So they spent the night. And he said, I don't have any. This, by the way, is hilarious in English. It's not that funny. In, it's not that funny in Hebrew, but it's hilarious in English. He said, um, I don't have any money with me right now, but I will I will give you a kid from the shearing. I'll, and that'll be like a pledge and a token that I'll pay you later. She's, she said, okay. So fast forward like half a year and people come to Judah and they say, wait, I left out part. He gave her his staff and his signet ring also as a pledge that he would return and give her a kid for payment. That's how that went. 
people come to Judah six months later and say Tamar's pregnant and he gets really mad because she's supposed to be not doing those things while waiting for her for his son so he says bring her to me and he's all mad and he's going to mur I almost said murder it is murder he's going to burn her at the stake for adultery and she says okay but before you do that can I give you something and she gives him his staff and his signet ring back because guess who the prostitute was she did that on purpose because she knew the law she's trying to obey the law so that her first husband has children and his line keeps going and Judah isn't cooperating so she tricks Judah into cooperating then Judah of course is all repentant and stuff he even says Tamar is more righteous than I that's how Tamar got into the genealogy of Jesus and the reason it's hilarious to me in English is because Judah says I'll give you a kid which he actually did he gave her a kid two of them in fact it was twins all right so that's the first one lady the second lady is Rahab you remember where Rahab's from Um, the book of Joshua where they're going into Jericho remember this and Joshua and Caleb and the soldiers know and they're hunting them down because they're out scouting and they're hunting them down and she hides them she also she is a prostitute she hides them and and she says to them um, I will hide you but you have to promise to save me and my family when you take the city so they they promise that and they do it she hangs that red cord out of her window so they know where she and her family are and they save her and her family and she becomes part of the Israelites she marries into the Israelite tribe and ends up being in the genealogy of Jesus and not not even peripherally because oh, where'd she go <sighs> Rahab Solomon the father of Boaz by Rahab so Boaz's mom is Rahab. Boaz, if you'll recall, married Ruth. Remember Ruth? Ruth and Naomi? That Ruth, the whole book of Ruth where Ruth and Boaz get together and they have Obed who is the father of Jesse Obed being King David's grandpap Jesse being King David's daddy which means Ruth who is a Moabite Ruth is King David's grandma and Rahab the prostitute is King David's great-grandma a Canaanite and a Moabite woman and then we come down here to the wife of Uriah it says because David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah Bathsheba she is not Jewish the wife the wife the daughter daughter of Sheba is her name Sheba is a Canaanite goddess I can't remember but she's not Jewish and we all know what happened to Bathsheba that one wasn't 
on Bathsheba, that was David being creepy. But, you know, he got her pregnant and then murdered her husband, plus a bunch of other men to cover it up, remember? Yeah. Anyway, the first baby that they conceived together died. The second was Solomon and his mom was Bathsheba. Always in scripture though, referred to as the wife of Uriah so that we never forget what David did to her and her family. Even though Solomon came out of that horribleness, still what David did was terrible. Four ladies in David's gene, David, Jesus' genealogy, none of them Jewish, which tells me a bunch of things, but I'll, I'll try to keep it down to a couple here. <laughs> First of all, it tells me that Messiah cannot, absolutely not, ever in a billion years, be only for Jewish people. Because that was a big fight at the beginning of the church, if you'll remember. that Messiah was, you had to be Jewish before you could be Christian. That was one of the big fights going on in the early church. I know people don't think there was fighting. Oh, if only we could go back to the way things were in the early church. We are, we're there. We're in the middle of the way things were in the early church. They were always fighting about stuff and so are we. Anywho, that was one of the big fights. Paul would go off to Gentile territory. People from Jerusalem would come up behind him and say to the people that he just told about Jesus, who were converted and loved Jesus, come into their churches and tell them, no, you're not really Christian because you're not part of the Jewish nation. So all your men have to be circumcised and you all have to convert to Judaism. <clears throat> then you can be Christian. And then they'd write to Paul and he'd be like, what? That's how we got Galatians. That's the whole point of Galatians. Go read it. It's not that long. It's also a pretty good read. It also tells me that that all through history, and certainly you can see it in the history of Jesus' genealogy, Yahweh involves women in the plan of salvation. And not just any women. I mean, you could say, well, no kidding. In a genealogy, there has to be women, right? Because guys aren't having babies on their own. Yes, that's true. But usually in a genealogy, women aren't mentioned. And in this genealogy, four women are mentioned on purpose. Four foreign, not Jewish, women who were active in their roles in being part of Jesus' genealogy. Tamar was certainly active. Rahab was certainly active. So was Ruth, if you'll recall that story. Go read that, too. That's a pretty good read as well. Ruth and Naomi. Naomi was telling Ruth how to make Boaz notice her. And what to do to get Boaz to marry her. And it worked. <laughs> and Bathsheba, while not active, she was passive in that. She had not a lot of choice in that. Still. Later, when you read Chronicles and Kings, you will see her taking a more active role when David got older and going into his chambers and reminding him that he promised to pass the throne on to Solomon, which he didn't, but he said, oh, oh yeah, I remember that. And that's how Solomon became king. God knows what he's doing. 
I get that from the genealogy of Jesus as well. God knows what what he's doing. God has this plan. He will not God will not be deterred from this plan. It includes Jews and Gentiles, it includes men and women, and that's still true today. It includes all of us. God uses all of us in the plan of salvation. All of us. And most often, as we see exemplified in the lives of those four women, most often God does things in an exceedingly unexpected and weird way. Never the way any of us would expect, and certainly would be our plan. That's why often in my prayer life, when I find myself telling our dear Lord what I think should happen, I have to correct myself. Which, by the way, is a lot easier on you to correct yourself than to um, have the Holy Spirit correct you. I'll just say that. Correct myself when I catch myself doing that. And remind myself and confess to our dear Lord that what do I know? Here I am laying out a plan when you have one that I'm sure is a gazillion times better and I'd never be able to guess it. So I'll just lay this out here in front of you and then I'll wait and see what you're going to do. Which is what the advice that the Bible gives us all the time, isn't it? Wait for the Lord. Wait and see. He even says that. You know, be still and know that I am God. That's what that means. Just stand there and watch what I'm going to do. I know what you need. I know how to get it for you. Stop interfering. <laughs> be still. That's what the be still is. Stop interfering and know that I am God. Stop interfering and remember between you and me which one of us is God. You ask me to take care of this so get out of my way now and watch me take care of it. That's our God. Our God is awesome and amazing and wonderful and surprising and indescribable even though I just tried to describe and for me it is a honor and a privilege and a joy to have been brought into God's family I hope you feel that way too and speaking of God doing things in the most surprising and unexpected ways let's pray the Benedictus Shall we? Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, <coughs> to set us free from the hands of our enemies free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, 
For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, your light of truth guides us to the way of Christ. May all who follow him reject what is contrary to the gospel. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, You have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and direct our days and our deeds in his peace. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, prayerlings, for putting up with my ranting this morning. I love the genealogy of Jesus. I don't know if you could tell. You know who else I love? You. I'll be back tomorrow and we'll pray together again, okay? So you can remember that I love you and that you know what I'm going to say, right? He loves you so much more I can't even tell you. I try to tell you all the time. I fall woefully short of how much he actually loves you. Have a beautiful day. Guten Tag.